Hey everyone, welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I am going to do a brief introduction about five minutes and then um, Lauren Burke is going to do her presentation and you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, we will answer them when it's a good time, possibly at the end, um, depending on what the questions are. Please keep your questions to on-topic questions um, related to the webinar topic, which is creating a Jekyll blog. Uh, this is being recorded and it will be put on our YouTube within, um, usually it's within a day. Data Umbrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science. We are a nonprofit organization. What we do is we organize these webinars on topics related to data science for the community. We organize hackathons and we have a website where we put um, resources. Uh, I'm a statistician by training, and you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub at Reshma S. We have a code of conduct, and we ask you to um, follow it to make this a welcoming, friendly, professional community for all, and that also applies as well to what is put in the chat. There are various ways that you can contribute to Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct and contribute to making it a welcoming and collaborative space where people want to return to. Uh, we have a Discord server as well, and the link to the Discord server is on our website, which is dataumbrella.org, and you can ask and answer any general questions there. You can also donate to our nonprofit. We are on Open Collective as Data Umbrella, and we are on Benevity. If you work for a company that uses Benevity, it's a platform where uh, you can make a donation and your company uh, matches it. We have a lot of playlists on YouTube. One of them is contributing to open source. Another is career advice. Um, and these are sampling of some of the playlists that we have on data visualization, data science for beginners, scikit-learn, Sprint, and PyMC and NumPy series. This is a sampling of some of our webinars that we've done. On our website, we have a lot of resources. We have a list of conferences. We have guides to using inclusive language. For example, in our webinars, we do not use, or in the chat, the word guys. We wanna use word that is wording and that is inclusive for everybody. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. We're pretty active on Twitter and LinkedIn at Data Umbrella. The meetup place is the place to join to find out about upcoming events. Uh, YouTube is where all of our webinars are posted. We have a blog as well, and we have a monthly newsletter, which um, has a lot of, you know, fun, uh, relative, uh, relevant information, and I'll share links to that in the chat. Um, we, we send out a monthly newsletter, and we do promise not to spam you with um, a lot of extra e unnecessary emails. We have live captioning on this platform that we're using. It's, it's a big marker platform. If you go to the very top, there, is, there are two letters called CC for closed captioning. So if you'd like a live transcript on the bottom, just click on those, that little CC icon. March is Women's History Month. And so we're doing a special series of events. Um, this talk, Lauren's talk on setting up a Jekyll blog is the fourth in our series. We have another one coming up next Tuesday, which is Intro to Hall of Is. We also have our April events coming up. The, there's one on the 5th called Editing Wikipedia because someone has to. And on April 26th, intro to the GraphQL API. Today's talk is setting up a personal website with Jekyll and GitHub pages. Our speaker is Lauren Burke, who is a data scientist in the healthcare technology space. She began her data science career in the retail space where she developed solutions across several areas, including supply chain, inventory management, and enterprise business. She recently transitioned into product data science after spending some time implementing forecasting solutions to support new and renewal business opportunities. Lauren is an active member of her local and larger tech communities. She is director of operations of women in analytics. She is a member of Tech Core Regional Steering Committee. She is vice chair of COSI's Connecticut Emerging Leaders Board. She is also a member of the Scikit-Learn communication team, and I am on the Scikit-Learn triage team as well. And so Lauren and I um, collaborate and work together quite often. Uh, you can find Lauren on LinkedIn at Lauren-E-Burke, and you can find Lauren on Twitter at Lauren underscore E underscore Burke. Uh, feel free to tweet about the event. Um, our Twitter is at Data Umbrella, and I will also share the Twitter um, 
the Twitter handle in the chat as well. And with that, I'm going to turn over the mic and camera to Lauren and let's get started. All right, thank you. So I will share my screen now. All right, so, oh, am I sharing? I'm not sharing yet. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about how you can use Jekyll and GitHub pages to build a personal blog or a personal website or a blog. So um, my name is Lauren Burke. I'm a data scientist in the healthcare technology space. I'm the director of operations of Women in Analytics, and I'm also a member of the communications team for Scikit-Learn. And so today we're gonna to be going over some background information on Jekyll and GitHub Pages, how you can create your site using Jekyll, how to host it on GitHub Pages, and then finally some customization options. So first let's cover some of the basics. First of all, I wanna talk about why it's important and why it can be useful for you to have a personal website or blog. And so first of all, it helps you establish your personal brand um, and since a website is way more customizable than a resume, GitHub, LinkedIn, or any other social media, and it also allows you to have greater control over the content you display and how you display it, and also what you sort of display front and center. It's a way for you to build out and showcase your portfolio, so show off the samples that serve as a directorized representation of your skill set and your best work that you're most proud of. It helps you gain visibility by making you more discoverable, and by making it easier for you to be contacted about relevant opportunities, for example, like speaking opportunities. It's also a way for you to showcase your accomplishments um, and it provides a space for you to promote yourself and share things about yourself, like how you're engaged with your community, any awards you've won, or any conferences you've spoken at. And finally, it's a space where you can share your knowledge. And so it's a great place for you to share things like tutorials and resources that can help others in your field and things that have helped you as well. So now let's go over some background information on Jekyll and GitHub pages. Jekyll is a Ruby-based static site generator, which is something that will build an HTML site from a number of provided files and templates. It offers built-in support for GitHub pages, and it has a very simple build process. It also supports Markdown and Liquid. And GitHub pages is a static site hosting service. So with it, you can host your site directly from GitHub for free, it supports HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, so you can customize it. And with it, you have the option to host your site via the free github.io domain or a custom domain of your choice. So why should you use Jekyll and GitHub pages? So first off, static sites are simpler, faster, more secure, and more flexible than a dynamic site like WordPress or Drupal. And the incremental build option reduces your overall build time by only regenerating pages that have been updated since the last time it was built. And GitHub also offers a free hosting option by including one free domain for each GitHub account, and that will be available at your username.github.io. It also has version control, so that helps you keep track of changes to your site, and it allows for multiple users to collaborate on one repo, for example, how we collaborate on the scikit-learn blog. So now let's move on to creating your Jekyll site. So to create your website, you'll need to have basic command line skills, basic knowledge of the HTML and CSS languages, and a GitHub account. So with Jekyll, we have two main options for creating our site. And our first option is by using an existing template, and you can do that by simply forking and then cloning that repository. So for example, we can do that with the popular minimal mistakes theme. And our second option, which is, is going to be starting from scratch, and that's what we're going to be over, going over today. So now let's get in Jekyll installed. So we want to first make sure that Ruby is installed on our machine. And it should be installed on Mac by default, but if you have a Windows machine, you may need to install it yourself. Then we'll want to install Bundler, which is a package manager for Ruby gems, and it allows you to track the gems you have installed and their versions and also provides a consistent environment for Ruby projects. And then finally, we want to install Jekyll. 
And all of these commands you can use in the terminal to complete this process. So here we're going to take the first step in creating our website. So using the CD command, we're going to navigate to the directory that will hold our site. In this case, I'll be using my document slash GitHub folder. And then we're going to want to create a new Jekyll project in that directory using the Jekyll new command. So here I'm creating a new project called my blog using Jekyll new my blog. And finally, we're going to want to again use that CD command to navigate into that newly created folder that holds our project. So CD my blog. And as you can see from the code on the left, now I am in the my blog folder and I can begin to work on the site. So now that we've created our site, we can run it locally and view it. First, we'll want to use the bundle install command and that will install any dependencies for our site. Then we can use the bundle exec Jekyll serve command and that will serve our site like locally. So now we can view it. And so it, now if we visit the server address right here and right here, you'll actually see your site built with the base Jekyll theme, which is called Minima. And now we can begin the fun part, customizing our site. So before we make any changes, let's take a quick look at what's inside of our project folder. So after serving our site, you should see eight objects in that project folder like these. First, we'll have the config file, which contains information about the site configuration variables. So this will be things like your site name, description, URLs, author information, formatting settings, et cetera. Then we'll have the posts folder, and that will contain all of the posts that will be displayed on your blog. Each post should be in its own markdown file, and it should be named in a date post name format. So each post will be required to have a date associated with it. Then next, we have the site folder, and that contains files that will help us compile our site. This folder will be created when you serve the site for the first time, and it will contain additional folders with information about each site page in their own individual folder. So then we have the about markdown file. This is a pre-created file that contains the content that will be published on the about page of your site. And we have the gem file. And that contains information on the site's dependencies, including the theme. So if we want to update our site's theme later on, we will also need to be updating this file. And then finally, we have the index markdown file, which contains the content that will be published on the home page. So we can begin to personalize our site by editing the config file, and that will be located in your main project directory. And in this case, I'm updating my site's title, the description, and the URL, the base URL here. So additionally, I've added my email address and some of my social links. And since we've changed the config file, you wanna make sure you save it to set those changes we've made. Then after saving the file, we want to run that bundle exec Jekyll serve command again, so we can view those updates locally. And so here you can see those changes I've made have come into effect. My blog name is up here. Um, my description is down here. My email and social links are right here. And this is at that social local server address, again, that I generate when I use this command. So now that we have our base site created, we can begin the process of pushing it to GitHub to host it. So first, let's initialize the repository. So within GitHub, you're going to create a new repo with your username followed by github.io. So in this case, I'm using lorberg2.github.io, and it will have to be in this format because that is the domain that you have available. So when you create this new repo, do not add any additional files. Now back in your terminal, you're going to initialize the git repository using the git init, git init command like this. And that's going to initialize the local project repository in that root directory for you. So now we'll need to add the jet, uh, Sorry, now we'll need to add the GitHub pages gem so our site will work properly with GitHub pages. So first you're going to go into that gem file and you can do this using any text editor to edit this. And you're going to comment out the line that references the Jekyll gem like this. And then you're going to either uncomment or add the GitHub pages gem like this. So since we've edited the uh, gem file, you're going to need to use the bundle update command so we update the site. And in 2020, GitHub actually changed their authentication, authentication process from being password-based to being token-based. 
And so now to perform certain actions with the GitHub API or with the command line, users are required to use what are called personal access tokens. And personal access tokens can be generated through GitHub, and they're an alternative option to using a password, password for authentication. So before we're going to be able to push our site to GitHub, we will need to generate one of those personal access tokens. And you can do this in GitHub by going into the settings tab that's under your profile, visiting the developer settings on the bottom of the menu on the left-hand side, and then clicking personal access tokens, then generate new token. So to generate a new token, you'll need to enter a name for it. And I would recommend using something that's related to your website or blog. In this case, I'm going to call it my blog token. Um, set an expiration date. In this case, I'm setting it so it will expire after 30 days. And then finally, setting the permissions you'd like to allow for use with that token. So for example, reading and writing to that repository. And then once you generate that token, make sure that you copy it and save it somewhere you can find later. Because once you exit that screen, you will not be able to view that exact token again later. Once we've generated a personal access token, we can now connect remotely to that repository and then push our project to GitHub. So back in Terminal, we're going to use our personal access token to set the remote repository like this with the git remote add origin, that personal access token, and then the name of our repository. Then we're going to add all of the changes and commit them. You can use an initial commit message like this just so you can record it. And then we're going to verify that the remote repository is correct. So if you do that, it should show you that the remote repository you set here is confirmed to be the one you want to push to. And then finally, we're going to push the site to that repo on GitHub using a command like this. And so if this is done correctly, when you open your GitHub repository, you should see all of your project files right here for your site. So now that we've pushed the project, we should be able to view our site on GitHub pages. And once we push it, our site should automatically begin to build. So since we're using a public repo for this, our GitHub Pages site will be built and deployed using something called GitHub Actions and a workflow for through that. So under the GitHub Actions tab in that repository, you can actually track the progress of the build and deployment process. So if there are any issues with that, you can easily investigate them by going into the Build and Deployment tabs on that workflow. But if everything works correctly, we'll now be able to view our site at the github.io domain. So you can see now that site I created and those edits I made to, to the name and to the description will now show up at that github.io domain for my username. So now that we've created and pushed our site, we can begin to talk about some of the customization options we have available. So first let's go over how we can update our theme. So we can update the theme of our site in a couple of different ways. Our first way is to use one of the themes that are supported by GitHub Pages. And so this process is much simpler and we can easily switch to another theme just by updating the theme variable in the config file. So in this case for Jekyll, when you create a Jekyll site, the base theme will be called minima like this, but there are a couple other options that can, you can use as a supported theme and that are very easy to add on. And you can easily find those linked right here. So our second option is to use what's called a remote theme. This gives us access to a greater number of themes. And so you can have more variety in the layout and maybe find a theme that's more suited to the main goal you have with creating this site or with a blog. So in this example, I'm going to be installing and showing you how to customize the minimal mistakes theme from Boatly. And you can see that, learn more about that by visiting this link here. So first we're going to go into our gem file and we're going to include the Jekyll include cache gem like this. And then we're also going to comment out that base theme of minima like this. And then we're going to update our config file to set the remote theme. So this is the link I will set for the remote theme to be minimal mistakes. And then also to our plugins list, make sure we add that gem, the Jekyll include cache gem like that. And then finally, we're going to use the bundle install command again to install any dependencies that are associated with that new theme. 
So now if we serve the site again, we should be able to see the new theme locally. So once we add, commit, and push the changes, we'll also be able to see the new theme on GitHub pages. So here you can see the theme has changed at my uh, base domain like this. So now instead of showing that minima theme, we're actually showing the default minimal mistakes theme. So it's a very simple process to change it. We can also update the color scheme for the minimal mistakes theme. And so by set, we can do that by setting the minimal mistakes skin in our config file. And it offers a number of themes and as well as the default theme that we saw earlier. So in this case, I'm choosing the dark theme, which will show up like this. And again, since we've made changes to the site configuration, we're going to want to use the bundle update and then follow that with the bundle exec, exec Jekyll serve command to update our site. So this is what you'll see locally, that new change to the site. Um, before you push any changes, you won't be able to see the updates to GitHub. But once you add, commit, and push those changes, this is what it, is what it will look like on your GitHub domain as well. The two basic file types that um, will determine the content that's displayed on our site are the posts and pages. Uh, by default, the list of posts will be displayed on our homepage in order of most recent, and that will be according to the date you set for each post. And so in the config file, we can update the default settings to show additional stats about each post, like the author name, the post date, and the expected read time. Um, we can also enable settings that show related posts, allow for comments, and allow for social sharing. So in this case, I have enabled it to show the post date and to show the expected read time. And you can see right here, this is what will happen in my recent post sequence right here. You can see that I have, I'm now showing the date and I'm showing the expected read time. And then here are some of the other settings you can choose to enable as well. So the front matter of our posts and pages is where we can set the variables and metadata for those posts and pages. And this is things like the title, layout, link, feature data images, et cetera. And then for posts, we can also assign any categories or tags within the front matter. So below are two examples of how we can configure the front matter for a page and for a post. So on this side, I have an example of the about page I've set the layout to be single. I've set the title and the permalink for that page. And I've also enabled something called the author profile, which we will talk about in a second. And then here is an example of a post. So I've set the title, I've set that date. And again, this will determine the sequence we display our posts. I've also assigned it one category and a couple of tags. If you expect to have a lot of posts on your site, it's usually a good idea to enable pagination and this will allow us to display our posts in smaller lists by setting the maximum number of posts we can display per page. So you can do this by adding the Jekyll paginate gem to the gem file, and then adding code to our config file that will set the paginate path and the number of posts to display. So in this case, I've told it to only display five posts per page. And then we also want to add the Jekyll paginate gem to our list of plugins. And so since we've altered the gem file and config file, we want to make sure we run the bundle install command again. And then if we ex uh, serve that site again, we will be able to see the changes. So you can see here on the right, since I have more than five pages on, since I have more than five posts on my site, it will give me a second page here. So I can continue that list in a way that's more easily, easily viewable by my users of my site. We can also add additional pages to our site. And to do this, we'll want to create a pages folder in the root project directory. And then within that folder, we're going to place new markdown files for our new pages. And so for each page, you're going to want to update the front matter to reflect the page layout, title, and link as shown here. And then you're going to use markdown or HTML to add content you'd like to display on that page. So in this case, I've added a little blurb about the About page, but you can add as much as you want and customize it in any way you like. Then back in the config file, we're going to want to add that pages folder to our include list. And so this will ensure that our site looks at and includes that file when it's compiling. And here, as you can see on the right, I've updated that About Markdown file, and this is how it will be displayed on my site when I go to the About page. So next we'll talk about how we can add menus and some navigation options. 
we can add what's called a site author profile to any or all of our pages by updating the config file. And so to do this, you're going to add an author variable and any relevant social links. You can also add an avatar image. Um, and to do that, you'll need to create an assets slash images folder. And then within that, place the avatar image you'd like to use before setting that link in that author variable like this. You can also add a short bio, your location, your email, and then any social links you want that will show up with an icon like this. So then to determine where you display the author profile, you're going to update the config file and the default, default formatting settings. So in this case, I have set the default formatting settings to show the author profile on not only every post, but also on every page. A little bit later, we can talk about how you can sort of customize that to only display on pages, certain pages or posts that you choose or not display it at all. We can also add a footer menu to our site and this will appear on every page of the website. You can do this by updating the config file and including the footer variable. Then you're going to configure the links you want by adding a label, icon, and URL address for each. And you to do to um, do this with icons, you can use the Font Awesome uh, icon library, and you can actually use this search here to see what icons you have available. There's some that are round, square, multiple colors, lots of options out there that you can check out. And so in this case, I've added a Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub uh, link to my footer menu. So we can uh, add navigation to our site by creating a data folder, and then within that, a navigation.yml file in our root project directory. So within this navigation file, we can add a header menu by updating the main menu variable with a list of the link labels and URLs we'd like to display. And so in this case, I've added an about, contact, portfolio, posts, and GitHub links to that header menu. And once enabled, our header menu will actually automatically toggle to display the ideal amount of links based on our screen size. So if you are, um, are moving the size of your browser or if you're viewing it on a mobile device, it will automatically fit the best size for that page for you. We can also add custom sidebars by defining them in that navigation file. And we can define as many custom sidebars as we'd like. Then we can choose to either display a sidebar on all pages and posts or only on certain pages and posts. So to display it on an individual page or posts, we can um, indicate that in the post page or post front matter uh, within that markdown file. So by setting the nav value under the sidebar variable in the front bar um, to the name of our custom sidebar, in this case, I've defined one called my sidebar, it will now be displayed on that post or page. And so our second option is to add the custom sidebar of your choice to all pages or all posts. And you can do that again by updating those default formatting section, sections. And again, we're gonna set that nav value within the sidebar variable. So as you can see on the right, I've defined a custom sidebar that's called my sidebar. It includes a section called archives. And within that section, it has two links, one to the category page and one to the tag page. And this is how it will be displayed on your site. If you have your author profile enabled on a certain page or posts, that uh, custom sidebar will be displayed directly below it on the left. So now we can go over some more additional blog specific settings. We can alter the content that's displayed on the top section of our homepage by editing that index markdown file in the root project directory. And using Markdown, HTML, and CSS, we can add text, images, and links to that to customize it as we see fit. So in this case, I've added a blurb that says, hi, I'm Lauren, this is my data blog, here's some intro text. And this will be displayed above that recent posts section on my homepage. So by default, the homepage will display a list of your recent posts, but if you'd prefer to have a more standard website that also includes a blog, we can instead display our posts on a separate page entirely. And to do this, you'll need to create a blog folder in the root project directory. And then within that, add an index.html file. Within that index.html file, we're going to set the layout to home. And if you remember, that is currently the layout that is used in our index file, index markdown file. But we're going to swap those so we can change the layout and we can kind of reconfigure our blog settings. 
Then back in that index markdown file, we're going to change the layout to something else, to another style other than home. In this case, I've set it to the single layout style. And also it's important to remember if, you, uh, it, if you're using pagination, you've enabled that earlier, you're going to need to update that paginate path in the config file to include the new name of that page. In this case, I have blog. And so this will also en enable that pagination on my new page. So in this case, you can see here, this is now my home page. It does not have the recent post section anymore. And instead, if I go to the blog page on my site, now those recent posts will be displayed exactly as they were on the previous homepage. If your main purpose in creating a site is to use it as a blog, it's usually a good idea to enable categories and tags for your posts. Categories and tags help us to organize our posts by grouping related content together, and using them also makes it easier for our users to find content on our site. Categories are generally broad groupings of posts, and each post should have only one or maybe two categories. Tags are used to describe the specific details of a post, and they help link related posts together. So a post can have multiple tags, but the best practice is to keep the number at no more than eight to 10 per post. We can enable categories and tags by adding the Jekyll archives gem to our gem file, and then updating the config file to uh, include the archives and collections code shown below. So for archives, you're going to want to add a category archives section and a tag archives section. And then within collections, you're going to want to add archives like this. Then in the pages folder, we're going to add two new markdown files, a tags and a categories markdown file. And for the categories page, you're going to set the title, permalink, and layout to categories, and then do a similar thing for the tags page. So now by adding categories and tags to the front matter of a post, we're going to assign those categories and tags to that post. And these will now appear on the categories and tags pages we've determined here. So back here, you can see on my tags page, I have a number of tags that have been assigned to my posts. It not only displays the name of the tag, but it also displays the number of posts that are associated with that tag. And when I click on one of these, it will actually take me down to the section. So if I click on the GitHub pages section, it will scroll me down. And so I can see those five posts that are associated to it. We didn't cover everything, but there are some other customization options that you can add to your site or blog. You can customize the page and post layout by using layout templates, adding header images or videos, adding galleries, adding a custom sidebar or a table of content, and much more. You can add site search by adding a search bar that will allow your users to search your site more easily. You can add a favicon, which is a custom icon that will display in your browser tab when someone visits your site. So those little tiny things at the top of the screen that are associated with site, it could be a logo, it could be a icon, it could be anything you like. You can instead use, choose to use a custom domain and that allows you to host your site via that domain instead of the free github.io domain. You can add Google Analytics to learn more about your site visitors. You can enable comments using a few different options. It's available through Facebook, Discus, Discord, Static Man, and a few others. You can um, embed a social feed from an account like Twitter or Facebook and many more options that you can find more about by um, even just by Googling. There's lots of stuff out there. Um, so finally, thank you all for having me today. And I hope you enjoyed learning about Jekyll and GitHub pages. And I also hope you have fun creating your own sites with your new knowledge in the future. Um, if you'd like to reach out with questions or just connect, I'm more than happy to do so. And if you wanna see um, the site and the repo I used to build the example in this tutorial, you can click right here. Thank you so much. Lauren, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. While people are uh, gathering their thoughts and putting any questions in the chat that they may have, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just try sharing my screen and see, oh, maybe I can't, okay. I think I need to, sorry, work on the settings. Um, but so what I want to, um, I do wanna ask some questions. The first is, um, do you recommend um, do you recommend like starting 
a blog from scratch or do you recommend copying a template? I think it's really up to your preference. If you would like to sort of customize it from the start, um, I would say start from scratch. But if you know what template you want to use and it's free and out there, for example, like the minimal mistakes one, you can easily go to that website. And then, as I mentioned earlier, fork and then clone that repository to your own website. Uh, one of the only reasons I would say it's easier to start from scratch is if you clone a repo, you will have to make sure that you update everything in there that's referencing the other repo. You'll make, need to make sure you're updating the links, if there's any social profiles, if there's any descriptions. Uh, there, I feel like there's just a little bit more kind of risk to you adding pages or posts or certain settings within that that are not as um, kind of apparent when you're setting it up from the beginning yourself and kind of choosing what to add and what to leave out. I think that's a great recommendation because I know I've tried copying some repos that I like and I have haven't been able to get them working because there's probably so many details that need to be updated that it is it is a good idea to start from a simple repo and build it up incrementally with the features as you have suggested. Right. There's also the issue of maybe that repo doesn't have the most up-to-date versions for something. So if you try to add a new plugin or um, some other customization that you might be able to do from scratch, that repo might not be as up to date. And so you might encounter issues and then you'll have to troubleshoot through that process. I think you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Um, wanted to avoid the New York sirens. Um, I had a question for you, which is, um, did you find setting up your Jekyll blog surprisingly easy or hard? Or what did you, you know, what would you say to um, people who are, you know, new to data science or have been practicing for a while and don't have a blog set up? I would say, depending on how familiar you are with GitHub and command line, um, it could be easy, e either easy or kind of difficult. For me, since I hadn't really set up a blog before, before I set up my own personal website, it was a decent learning curve um, because I had to learn about how to do certain things. There are certain things I covered, like the fact that you need to add a personal access token and some other of the troubleshooting tips I included in there that I had to go and sort of figure out what was going on myself. They weren't as apparent when I was following tutorials myself. And that's the reason I chose to include some of those things. Um, but I think if you are familiar with GitHub, how the process works, and you are familiar with Terminal, it's not too hard of a process. If you're trying to do specific customizations, that might require a little bit more effort. You might have to go find out, find examples of that or try and code it up from scratch yourself. But I don't think it's truly that difficult of a process. It might just be a little tricky to get started if you're not as familiar with it. But I truly think anyone can set up a Jekyll blog if they want to, and I would highly encourage you to. Um. I, I have one more question is, is there an option to do night mode um, in the blogs? I saw that in your screenshot example, there was one that was night mode and just wondering if that's an option. So minimal mistakes, for example, which is the one I showed today, that does have a number of sort of default skin settings that you can enable just by setting that minimal mistakes skin variable in the config file. And one of them is a dark setting. There are a couple others. I think there's also one that's more black and white. There is also an option for you to custom code your uh, your own theme. And I've done that in an example. I did that for the scikit-learn blog where I chose the scikit-learn colors and I, uh, and I changed the theme from one of the base settings to those instead. I don't think there is, at this point, a sort of simple way to enable what you have on the data umbrella blog where you can easily switch from dark to light mode with a uh, slider at the top. But um, there are ways that you can customize the visibility and a accessibility for your site just by going into the what are called the SASS settings. And you can find those on the minimal stakes repo, download them and customize them yourself. I think, you know, we have been um, 
collaborating since January on the um, Psychic Learn blog, and I really like um, I really like a comment that um, you made on the discussion, which is on the Psychic Learn blog repo, which is that minimal mistakes is just that it is minimal. Um, and so, you know, one of the advantages of that is that you can get it up and running really quickly with a great number of um, options. So maybe, you know, it's a good way to start, you know, and then if people want to build on more complex and options, that's a good thing to do. Yes, I agree. I think uh, minimal mistakes, it is a free theme, which is beneficial if you don't want to have to pay for a uh, sort of template for your website or your blog. And especially if you're trying to do the entire thing for free, since with GitHub, you can host it for free as well. Uh, there are paid themes out there that have a little bit more sort of professional look to them. But I think minimal stakes is a great sort of beginner theme or honestly just a great theme in general. If you want to have a website and you don't, you aren't planning to have it as sort of a um, like a brand website or anything, but it's just your own personal website. It has everything you need to accomplish a uh, having a nice personal website and blog. And there are a lot of customization options. So yeah, I would say uh, your kind of main options when creating a site or blog are creating a free version that might be a little bit simpler and scaled down, um, buying a paid theme, which will have a little bit cleaner, more professional look, or um, becoming very proficient in JavaScript, HTML, CSS, Ruby, something like that, and coding your own theme up from scratch, which would probably be a little bit more time consuming than the other two methods, unless you already know those. One of the, um, also one of the other advantages to having this uh, blog hosted publicly on GitHub is that other people, you know, like for instance, for Data Umbrella, other people can contribute to the blog with a pull request, which is great. Obviously my personal blog, I don't, I don't want other people contributing to my personal blog, but for say Data Umbrella or Scikit-Learn, it's nice to have that option. Yes, uh, it's really good if you're, if you're going to be creating a blog with people that are already familiar with GitHub, because it's very easy, uh, especially with the scikit-learn blog, um, I would say everyone on that team is pretty familiar with GitHub and how to create a pull request, how to update certain things. So it's it's definitely a very easy transition from knowing GitHub and having collaborators that know GitHub to all of you collaborating together on a website or blog of your choice. And we do have a question, which is, um, uh, Lucy says, great talk. Uh, do you have advice for writing blogs about how to catch your audience? Um, I don't have a ton of uh, advice for specific blog writing. I, as a data person, I feel like I talk better in numbers than in words. So <laughs> I don't actually have any blog posts on my personal website. But I would say there's, there's lots of good resources out there. Uh, if you're just getting into it, I would say write about things you know that you think people would help people. Um, write about things that you have maybe had issues with when you were first getting started and you think could help others all down the line. And one really good thing you can do is add SEO, so search engine optimization keywords, so it's easier for people to find your blog or website depending on the specific topics you're talking about. Okay. Um, sorry, I was. I really wish that I could share my screen because I wanted to show um, some of the blogs and stuff as such. Um, and um, yeah, what I want to do is, is I want to show you look, what I want to show my blog because when I first started blogging, I have one of my earlier blogs is just skeletal. It's it was two paragraphs and it wasn't particularly impressive and it took me a lot of effort to write it. And I still keep it on my blog site because I want to see, I want to at least remind myself how far I have come in blogging. And so, you know, what I would say to answer that question is just start, just start, even if your blog is one paragraph and just practice and build it up and then you will have other blogs and there's options to add images and two images side by side and highlight, you can even highlight text within Jekyll. There's a lot more options in this Jekyll package than even you have in Medium. You know, Medium is another option. It's not a Jekyll option, but with Jekyll, there's just so many options that are available. So, um, so yeah. Um, yeah, 
I, I would echo that just getting started. And even if you're feeling the same way about a personal website, it can be bare bones at first. It's, it's really about getting started. And then like all the benefits I talked about earlier, um, you're more discoverable, you can have a portfolio. And if you're going to be using it as a blog, uh, no matter what you're contributing, someone out there is probably going to find it beneficial. Um, even if you feel like you're new in the field, this is your first blog, um, this is the first time you're going over this topic, even if it's just kind of writing up a uh, sort of overview of what you've learned on a tutorial or in a class or your first sort of experience using a new method or a new algorithm. Um, just starting is, is I would say, the first step. And that's kind of the hardest step, right? But once you get past that, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for you to grow. And I really love uh, what you said about you have your first blog still, your first post still on the blog, because I think that also speaks to, like, you can also see the journey you've come through and other people can see that. And that's, I think that's very encouraging for people who are starting out and don't really know where to start or where they want to go. But you can find and kind of fine tune that along the way. And that's, that's part of the fun of the process, right? Right, right. It, you know, and I want to add to that, one of the most common questions that we have is how do I, you know, how do I get a data science job, you know, and um, building your data science portfolio, one of the ways to do it is to build a blog. And if you use Jekyll, you're also using the tools that are open source that are related, such as GitHub pages and Markdown and um, some HTML. You can't escape using HTML, CSS as a data scientist, um, believe it or not. Um, and so it is a way to build your data science portfolio as well. Um, I have been blogging for now four years now. Um, I shared a link to my blog. It's reshmas.github.io. And um, it's also you know, a great way, like when I um, do consulting work, I, I send people my blog link or it's on the signature of my email. Um, it's on my Twitter handle as well. And so people can see you know, who I am and what the kind of work that I do. And it provides, you know, with the internet, there's there's so many more people that are applying to jobs. And um, this sort of provides some information initially on um, you know, who I am and what kind of work that I do. So um, to that question, you know, particularly questions about getting jobs are the most popular questions that um, we receive. Um, there is yeah. a Real quick to just like sort of comment on that. And this is a really good point that um, you just made. Instead of you finding opportunities, this allows opportunities to find you because your, your profile, your work is out there. So instead of you having to seek out new job opportunities or speaking engagements, um, the greater chances are that someone will instead find you and offer those opportunities to you when you are already out there and you sort of have a portfolio or kind of combined um, compilation of what you what you uh, do and what you have done and your skill set. Yeah, you know, to add to that, many years ago, probably five or six years ago, before I set up my Jekyll blog, I had a WordPress site. And so initially it was, um, you know, I could host it for very little, like four or $5 a month or something. And then I could buy the domain for really cheap. And I did that. And then over time, it, the prices went up. Like I was paying a lot per month and I was paying a lot for the domain. And it was hard to cancel it from GoDaddy. And I thought, oh, I, you know, this is just, this is too much. This is too much to spend, um, on, on, you know, on, on, a, on a simple blog for myself. And so I canceled it. And so I went to the whole Jekyll way. And it's just, there is such a relief in knowing that it's not costing um money and yet you can share information so yes absolutely there's a question here which is in a portfolio for entry-level data scientists what are components pages elements would you recommend to have on the website um so i would say i mean depending on what projects you're you're covering if you are also using github to create a portfolio you could link your projects that way. You could create an image that sort of is the overview, um, a little blurb about it. You could even link it back to the, the GitHub repo and sort of add a more thorough description there. Um, I would say 
either you can put, if you're very new, maybe just put everything on there so you can show that you have a wide range of experiences. But as you sort of find your niche or your um, focus area, maybe you can highlight the specific things that really speak to the skills you have in that area and the sort of projects you've accomplished using those specific skill sets. You also have a portfolio. You can speak, you should speak to that as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would say um, start incrementally, start, you know, something that's very simple, such as having a link to your LinkedIn. If you're on Twitter, I'm um, having that whatever social media platforms you are on that you want to share. Um, and, you know, a couple of articles, um, maybe an about me, I would check out a lot of other people's blogs out there and see what you like about them and what you want to include about yourself there. Um, but I would start small, I would start incrementally. And then, you know, over time, you might want to share some other things as well. Um, there's a question there for me, which is, Reshma, do you use a template or did you do it from scratch? So I set mine up about uh, four, four or five years ago. Um, I believe I did it, um, well, minimal mistakes is a template, right? Would you say that, Lauren? So I used, um, I used something similar. I don't know if mine is officially minimal mistakes, but there's there's a bunch that you can choose from. And I probably, I think I liked somebody else's. And so I chose the theme for it. And um, and so that's what I did. Um, if it was a data umbrella blog, I purchased a template for that. So, yeah. Um, and so I don't see any more questions. And I really want to thank Lauren for um, accepting the invitation to speak and putting together this presentation. Um, I think it's extremely, extremely valuable and very well presented with uh, details and steps. So thank you so much for um, you know, spending I know for you, it's your lunch hour as well as it is for me. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And so this recording will be available usually within 24 hours. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope, I hope if you attended, you learned something and you will go out and apply it and build your own really cool websites or blogs. <laughs>